I got a question. Though. Sure. How long is this going to take? It shouldn't take a whole lot longer. Do you think I can get there before 129? Um, probably not. Uh, What's at 129? Well, I had a project to 164. Okay. This is the story of the wrongful conviction of Brennan Dassey. Over the course of season two, we explore the constitutional errors at the heart of this injustice, the chaos of Kaczynski, and the techniques responsible for determining Brendan's fate. The conversation continues. Welcome to the sixth hour. five years. I've spent hours, days at a time, buried under the weight of the wrongful conviction of a Michigan High School special ed student who had gone to school on February the 27th, 2006, as an innocent 16-year-old kid, only to experience a macabre initiation into adulthood at the hands of local law enforcement when he left as a suspect in one of Wisconsin's most notorious criminal investigations. This profound miscarriage of justice is Brendan's story. He's a learning disabled 16 year old not equipped to face the trouble in which he finds himself and isn't getting much help, in my view. It's just whatever his personal failings here, there, there have been a series of systemic failings that are troubling if you think about them too much or take them personally. You know, I'm not sure that I'm doing fully what I should be doing when I'm worrying about whether other people who are, are not in my charge are um, being ground up and spit out by this system, or being treated unjustly. I need to worry about whether it's me. Located on Lake Michigan and resting at the mouth of the Manitowoc River, the town of Manitowoc is full of roads untraveled and a life unseen by Brendan Dassey. Once a sundown town that prohibited African Americans from staying overnight, it is of no surprise that its historical behaviour of disenfranchising the marginalised and its systemic leanings towards classism should materialise as an adjunct perception in the wrongful conviction of Brendan Dassey, beginning with the theft of his presumption of innocence. But it had an accomplice. It had the media. Now, the presumption of innocence actually originated from Roman law and was canonised by the phrase, proof lies on him who asserts, not on him who denies. It was eventually adopted by English common law, replacing its system of presumed guilt, and established in the US justice system via Supreme Court ruling Coffin v US in 1895. However, hundreds of years later, it is a sad truism that the presumption of innocence is not universal. 
despite the United Nations incorporating the principle in its Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 and integrating it into the UN International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in 1966. Fending off the layers of social stratification and its wildly unequal distribution of rights and privileges, and a criminal justice system that criminalises poverty and punishes and impoverishes the poor. For the young Brendan Dassey in 2006 Manitowoc, the presumption of innocence diminished with each press conference or statement given to the throng of zealous media outlets and reporters waiting for the day's clickbait. It is evident that the sacred principle holding that a defendant is innocent until proven guilty, that a prosecution must prove beyond a reasonable doubt each essential element of the crime charged, was long forgotten in the dust of Kratz's immoral and highly prejudicial press conference. Ethically questionable, Kratz salivated as he conducted the now infamous March 2nd presser, placing the shackles at Brendan's wrists and ankles with each word he spluttered. Media culpability was evident in an opinion published in 1951 by Justice Robert H. Jackson in Shepherd v. Florida. He was baffled by the behaviour of the Central Florida Press. An excerpt reads, but prejudicial influences outside the courtroom, becoming all too typical of a highly publicised trial, were brought to bear on this jury with such force that the conclusion is inescapable that these defendants were prejudged as guilty and the trial was but a legal gesture to register a verdict already dictated by the press and the public opinion which it generated. Sounds hauntingly familiar. Now, this culpability was woven into the macabre, circus like atmosphere of Manitowoc in 2007. Journalistic objectivity was as scarce as the forensic evidence. Reporters eagerly bought into the prosecution's bogus confidence, seemingly unable to ponder alternative theories other than the one presented by the prosecution. Yet we only need to look to November of 2015, where emails recently released by AC Rookie document W Bay TV reporter Emily Matisik, who had covered the trials in 2007, in a series of emails to Tom Fallon and Mark Weger regarding the release of Making a Murderer. This is Emily. Holy shit, who's coming over to watch this on Netflix with me? I'm just in shock they got a deal for this. The press release makes them sound like a victim. I have to watch just to see how slanted their version of the truth really is. All this from a reporter who covered the case in real time. It is of no surprise the people of Wisconsin were so ill-informed, with such journalistic bias, so potent that it surfaces once again eight years on. In this episode of The Sixth Hour, I welcome the intensely insightful Dean Strang. We take a step back in time to Manitowoc to discuss the temperature of 2006-2007 and the impact his involvement as co-counsel in Wisconsin's most notorious criminal trial had then and now. A criminal defence lawyer and professor of law and an accomplished author, Dean has published books of legal history Worse Than the Devil, Anarchists, Clarence Darrow, and Justice in a Time of Terror, and Keep the Wretches in Order, America's Biggest Mass Trial, The Rise of the Justice Department, and The Fall of the IWW. And his law review articles and essays have been published widely. The conversation continues. Joining the sixth hour today is a prolific criminal trial lawyer, law professor and author, 
who rose to international prominence for his role as co-counsel alongside Jerry Booting in the 2007 representation of Stephen Avery. I welcome Dean Strang to the conversation. Thank you so much for joining me, Dean. Thanks for asking. You began your career as a litigator in a large civil firm, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, and you enjoyed a short stint as an assistant US attorney and became Wisconsin's first federal public defender. What was the catalyst for becoming a criminal trial lawyer? How did you find yourself in 2006 representing a defendant in one of Wisconsin's most notorious criminal trials? Well, the... It started at the what you've described as a large civil firm, and that that was a large firm only by Milwaukee, Wisconsin standards. I think there were 75 or 80 lawyers there when I was there uh, doing civil work. I had no no particular interest at all in criminal work, although by sheer coincidence an increasingly large circle of my friends at that time, right after I graduated from law school were public defenders. But while working at that civil firm and preparing to try a large uh, actuarial malpractice case in federal court in Detroit, I got introduced to the man who was then and still you know, today arguably is, is the best criminal defense lawyer the state of Wisconsin has ever produced. He was brought in to take charge of that civil case that I described, which didn't sit well with the civil firm I was working for. I think they felt that the client had shown a lack of confidence <laughs> in our trial skills. And I was the I was the baby lawyer on the case. I wouldn't have had any significant role at trial anyway. But the arrival of this prominent criminal defense lawyer bumped me down yet another step on the ladder. And so I wasn't happy about it either. But I very quickly, you know, I, I could say became enamored of him or fell in love with him in a, you know, in a professional kind of way, whatever you'd want to describe it. But meeting him in the early summer of 1986 uh, turned out to be a turning point in my life. I got interested in criminal law generally because of him and because of this group of young public defenders I had fallen in with. That led, that awakening interest in criminal law led to the short stint as a federal prosecutor you described me as an enjoy as enjoying that. I did not enjoy it, actually. I, <laughs> I, I didn't enjoy it at all and was disastrously bad at it. And after 10 months or something, uh, the same lawyer called me up and asked me, wasn't I done being a prosecutor by now? And I said, yeah, I can't leave a job after 10 months. And he said, why not? And you know, and he asked me to come over and meet his his other partners, one of whom was his wife, and then there was a, a third partner who also became a wonderful mentor. I came over and, and met them, and they hired me, and that was September of 1988, and that's when I embarked on criminal defense. That led eventually to becoming, as you noted, the first federal public defender in Wisconsin as that office got created in 1999. And then I was hired in early 2000. And I, I took the case you're describing, Stephen Avery's case, probably not quite six months after I left the job as federal public defender. And part of the reason I took that case was that I was eager at that point to prove to my colleagues that I could still find the state courthouses and I could still operate in state court, that I wasn't, I wasn't the federal public defender anymore. And I, you know, my capabilities weren't limited to federal court. So this was a case where the money was lighter than, you know, uh, sort of an accountant or a business person would have wanted it to be for the size of the undertaking. 
but it, it was a chance to get back into state court, you know, on a state law case visibly. And that's, that's how I agreed when uh, Stephen Avery and, and his family asked me to represent him. Did you have any idea of the scope of the case going into it? Yes. Yes. The, yeah. the case had been ongoing at that point for about four months, give or take. Mr. Avery had been charged back in November of 2005. I got in in February of 2006. And even before Mr. Avery was charged, it was big news in the state of Wisconsin. It was getting a great deal of TV coverage, internet attention, newsprint. That began the very day that Teresa Halbach was reported missing. Just because Stephen Avery, thanks to his exoneration in 2003, was something like a public figure in Wisconsin. At least he was a very familiar name in the state because of his exoneration and the media attention and political attention that produced, for example, when the governor of Wisconsin and the legislators put together a blue ribbon commission to consider criminal justice reforms in light of Mr. Avery's exoneration, that commission came to be known as the Avery Commission. So he was well known. The new case against him in 2005 was heavily covered. I was well aware of it and yeah. had a pretty good sense of what I was getting into. Yeah. Your books on legal history, your opinion pieces and your discourse, I have to mention this, they feature an almost poetic fluidity that's not often associated with legal doctrine. Recently reading your discourse for Northwestern's Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology, Inaccuracy in the Involuntary Confession, Understanding Rogers v. Richmond Rightly. I was struck by the confluence of your writing, and you speak much to human dignity and institutional integrity, both of which were severely lacking in small town Manitowoc in 2006. I'd like to take a little step back to 2006, to March the 2nd to be exact, and to get your thoughts on Ken Kratz and Jerry Pagel obliterating one of the most sacred principles in the American system of justice, the presumption of innocence for both Brendan and his uncle Stephen. Now, history tells us that Kratz salaciously relays a gory, fantastical narrative based on what we now know, and perhaps people at the time did know, was a coerced, contaminated, uncorroborated involuntary confession. Did you watch the press conference in real time? And was it the first time you had heard of the supposed involvement of Brendan Dassey? I did not watch the press conference in real time. I was aware that it was happening, as I recall, probably just from checking in, you know, on local news sites on the internet. Or it may have been that I, you know, that I had, had calls from Avery family members or something. I don't remember how, but I knew I was aware of it at the time. It was in the middle of the afternoon on a work day. I didn't watch it in real time. I certainly did watch it later. And I was really angered, uh, really angered by the qualities you described, especially the devastating impact I thought it would have on our ability to impanel uh, an objective, untainted jury, and for that matter, Brendan Dassey's ability to do the same thing. I know that there are some news outlets that are carrying this live, and perhaps there may be some children that are watching this. I'm going to ask that if you're under the age of 15, that you discontinue watching this press conference. We have now determined what occurred sometime between 3.45 p.m. and 10 or 11 p.m. on the 31st of October. 16-year-old Brendan Dassey, who lives next door to Stephen Avery in a trailer, returned home on the bus from school about 3.45 p.m. He retrieved the mail. I mean, you filed a motion to dismiss the charges 
against Stephen because of inflammatory and, and the pre-trial publicity. Would it be correct to say that making those types of extra judicial statements like Kratz did was unethical? Was it a violation of Wisconsin's rules of professional conduct? It's, it certainly was ethically questionable. And one of the problems, I'm not trying to be evasive in answering that question, yeah. but the, the, the most honest answer I can give you is that it was ethically questionable. The reason that it was questionable rather than clearly unacceptable or clearly acceptable uh, is that the ethical rules are themselves fuzzy edged. Now, mm. you know, at some, at some level, ethical rules have to be written generally and be more prescriptive, I guess, than proscriptive or, you know, bright lines are hard to draw in the abstract on ethical questions. I thought this at least arguably crossed the line uh, on, on fair public comment by a lawyer involved in a case before a trial in a forum to which potential fact finders, that is, you know, members of the jury pool would have ready access. Um, and indeed, I think essentially every television media market in Wisconsin, and there are seven of them, had a camera present, one or more reporters. There were a lot of the radio stations that had people there. All of the print media uh, from around the state had people there. So potential jurors could tune into this in any number of ways. And as happens here with, you know, the lack of prior restraint on uh, the media in this country, I knew, Jerry and I knew immediately that now it wasn't just the press conference on March 2. We were now destined to see clips of that or references to it and quotations of lines from it for the months that would follow before the case was tried, because this would now be incorporated into the media narrative and echoed or repeated time and again. So it, it wasn't a one you know, time wound. It was going to be a, a death by a thousand cuts to use a, you know, a tired cliche, but that's, it's not inapt. That's what it was gonna be. And indeed that's what it was. Yeah, I mean, 15 years later, it's still referenced. Yeah, and when we got to picking a jury, the better part of a year after that March 2, 2006 press conference, you know, in late January of 2007, when we began to pick a jury, and the court had sent out hundreds of questionnaires to prospective jurors to have them fill out in advance and send back to the court so that the judge could take an initial pass at potential jurors who clearly were not qualified to sit or for whatever reason couldn't sit on a protracted trial like this, leaving us with, I don't know, 130 something potential jurors who, you know, didn't have surgery planned or didn't have an unalterable conflict or a health problem or, you know, whatever it might be. And of that 130 plus jurors, the judge sifted out of the pile of initial questionnaires. Uh, my recollection is that all but one of those 130 plus jurors admitted on the questionnaire that they already had an opinion of Stephen Avery's guilt or innocence. And it wasn't that he was innocent. All but one. That's where we started in picking a jury. And yes, there had been publicity, including press conferences by the sheriff or other law enforcement officials and by Mr. Kratz before March 2. And there had been press coverage independent of them. That's all true. But the March 2 press conference stood out. Yeah. 
I mean, he clearly asks children under age of 15 to discontinue watching and declares that we've now determined what occurred on March the 31st, which is a lie. But there's no such warning for potential jurors. No, and, and the warning, maybe, maybe the intentions behind the warning were good, but the practical effect of giving him a warning like that on TV in the middle of the afternoon is everybody turns up the volume, you know? Absolutely. Oh, this, is, this the, must be juicy. This must be something, spe- something different, you know? Because yes. we're not talking about late night television here where children should already be in bed or something. This is, you know, the yeah. equivalent of, of slapping a movie rating, you know, saying fit for adults only. Yeah. On a midday press conference. So the, the effect was was the opposite, I think, of, of having people turn off their their television sets. Do you think at any stage that the the press conference was purposeful? Or do you think it was just Kratz being over enthusiastic? I'm speculating. Mm. I'm speculating, but I my my sense of Ken Kratz was that he had not yet met a microphone or a television camera he didn't adore. Yeah. You know, he'd been laboring in this small rural county with a steady diet of, you know, drunk driving and animal abuse and disorderly conduct cases for much of his career. He now had a closely watched case that was a first degree intentional homicide, had the most serious possible consequences, and that this was a moment to shine uh, while the spotlight was on. I understand that reaction of lawyers. I understand that, but I'm, and I'm speculating, but my guess is that, you know, he got sort of carried away with the publicity possibilities. And indeed, to be fair, to Mr. Kratz, he since, in recent years, has expressed regret about how he handled that press conference. You know, he's expressed some regret about it at the edges in the way he handled it. Yeah, I think he said that if he had his time again, he would read the complaint uh, and that would be it. Yeah, and I don't know that would have solved the problem, but again, I, I even he, in in retrospect, uh, ha- has expressed some second thoughts about the wisdom of laying out a horror story narrative mm. that, as you say, not only was largely uncorroborated, but was entirely disproved in significant details by the trace evidence and forensic analysis that the state had. But, you know, like any other horror story, they're hard to forget once you've heard them. Absolutely. And I think it's human nature that we we hone in on what frightens us the most. You know, it's almost like an attraction. Absolutely. And and, And that it turns out to be fiction doesn't make it less memorable or, for that matter, less frightening. And this one turned out to be fictional, at least in significant respects, but that's lost um, by the time you get to trial. Now, there's a scene in Making a Murderer that captures you speaking as you're driving, and you say, and I quote, he's a learning disabled 16-year-old who's not equipped to face the trouble in which he finds himself and isn't getting much help. Whatever his personal feelings here, there's been a series of systemic failings that are deeply troubling if you think about them too much. I get a sense of uh, fatigued inevitability about that statement. Were you conscious of Kaczynski's behavior? And if you could unpack those failings that you refer to, and I I guess how it it might have impacted you at the time or, or even in retrospect. Well, I was quite conscious of, you know, the the progress of Brendan's case. It it had been uncoupled from Stephen Avery's only in the sense that they were going to be tried separately. 
but the you know the police reports, the other materials that we had from the state were identical to the materials disclosed to Brenda Dassey's lawyer, and you know, and the and the state's narrative was the same in both cases. Both cases were uh, progressing toward trial on parallel tracks with Brendan's just a couple of months behind ours. So I was well aware of it. And, you know, that's me 15 years ago speaking, but I had been, I'd been practicing law for over 20 years at that point and did feel weary of police officers who are careless with the constitutional rights of people in their custody, p- police officers who are manipulative and taking advantage of the tolerance of American courts for police officers lying to vulnerable people in custody to try to trick or manipulate them, tired of the formulaic way in which advice of rights is given in the United States that mm. you know prompts hundreds of thousands of uneducated you know or poorly equipped people in custody every year simply to fail to assert mm. the rights they should be asserting um, in their own self-interest and for their own safety tired of a system that underfunds the defense of the indigent because when you pay appointed defense lawyers $40 an hour as Wisconsin did then and does today, you know, in a profession where I can bill at $450 an hour to Mm. my clients who are paying by the hour and where top civil lawyers may be billing at 800 or 900, even $1,000 an hour, $40 an hour just in the market means you have to be really lucky to get a capable lawyer by court appointment. Now it's different if you happen to get the state public defender's office. We've got a good state public defender office in this state and the quality of public defender offices is uneven in the United States, but I would take my chances every time and everywhere with an employee of a public defender office over a private lawyer who is bereft enough of clients to find $40 an hour court appointments attractive as a financial proposition. Yes. Now, again, you you can get some capable court appointed lawyers. Why? Because good lawyers have an obligation to do pro bono work, like serve the poor, you know, I mean, you you can get them, Mm -hmm. but it is not a sure thing. And it's not a market force (laughs) that produces a good lawyer for you if you're indigent. And this is a country like Australia and like most countries around the world in which almost everybody charged with a crime is in fact indigent has nowhere near enough money, even drawing on family, to hire any lawyer, let alone a good one. And I could go on, but I, in that particular instance, I was also speaking in the context of a case that now had to be defended after this onslaught of prejudicial pretrial publicity, some of it, and indeed the worst of it, sponsored by the state, by the prosecution, and that included a number of unsupportable and outright false details. So if you detected a note of weariness in a guy who was really too young to be world weary, I was just 45 or 46 years old at that point, you were right (laughs) to, to note that. And, you know, and I will say that if you're a person of color, in this country, it only gets worse. It only gets worse. Brendan had his lack of sophistication, his learning disabilities, and his 
poverty in a, in a broad sense, a poverty of education, a poverty of life experience, a poverty of intellect, a poverty of emotional resources. He, he had his various forms of poverty and his youth to deal with. He did not also have to deal with, you know, being black or being Hispanic or Asian or Native American. And yeah. in, in our system of criminal enforcement, all of those factors only add to the disadvantages you face. Yeah, the marginalization of the alienation the and, the, and the marginalization. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it was apparent that there was a saturation of media and negative media. And I, I can only imagine the impact, you know, and this is from watching the show. This is from, from reading transcripts and, and case files. I mean, I think it's Kratz made at least seven statements to the press implicating Brennan and Stephen, and that's only in the first four months. And then that impacts amplified by the 10 or so appearances Kaczynski made incriminating Brendan. This is NBC 26, live at 10. The developing story tonight, an accused killer, Brendan Dassey, has a new attorney. Well, Dassey's new attorney is Len Kaczynski of Nina. Kaczynski says he accepted the Dassey case knowing it would be his greatest professional challenge. We have a 16-year-old who while uh, morally and legally responsible, was heavily influenced by someone that can only be described as something close to evil incarnate. Uh, Kaczynski says he may be willing to approach prosecutors about a plea deal in this case, but if the case does go to trial, he'll ask for a jury from western Wisconsin. Right. Evil incarnate. How about that? And that's Strong what he called words. Stephen Avery. I, I'm really interested to know what the public temperature was at the time in Wisconsin towards Brendan and even towards the defense teams? It was not favorable. There, there was then, especially as to Stephen Avery, a wide perception that he was guilty as charged. And whether that was the pretrial publicity, whether it was a backlash from having been on this pedestal and people having said, gosh, here's a guy who did 18 years in prison and it turns out he really was innocent of the rape and that's terrible. You know, and, and people are, are in general, people not involved in the legal system are slow to believe that those kinds of mistakes actually happen. And so I think people overcame their basic trust in the police and in the court system, getting the right person in a criminal case to feel sympathy for Stephen after his exoneration and tentatively in that sense to sort of elevate him. And now he comes toppling off that pedestal rapidly as he's accused of an even more serious crime. And indeed, you, you don't have to look too hard or you didn't have to look too hard at the time for people who were willing publicly to voice a sentiment like this. Well, I know he was innocent of the rape. I mean, I get that, but maybe we should have just left him in prison if he was going to get out and do this. You know, I mean, that, that sort of sense of betrayal and anger and irrational response, irrational but understandable response to, you know, the possible horror of Stephen having murdered a faultless young woman after being released because of his innocence on an earlier crime, I, th I think really as I say, I used the word backlash. And I, I, I had a sense at the time that he was facing even more pretrial animosity than would the normal or average person charged with a murder. Yeah. You know, you're, you're never the home team. <laughs> you're playing an away game when you're the defendant charged with something like murder. But I, th I think it was even more so for Stephen. And of course, all that splashed on Brendan as well. 
And yes, I think by degree, some people looked at Brendan and said, well, he's a kid and he, he looks like a passive kid, which indeed he was. So probably he's less culpable than his uncle. You know, I think that was a probably a widely held perception among mm -hmm. people in Wisconsin, but it did not translate into most people thinking that Brendan was innocent. It translated more into people thinking he was guilty, but perhaps somewhat less culpable than his right. uncle. He was a sophomore at Michicot High School. That's where Chris Duffy joins us live with that part of the story. Chris. Well, Jeff, school here got out less than one hour ago, and one teacher told me that students and school officials both have been asked to not speak with the media today due to the delicate situation at hand. Now, after school got out, teachers lined the sidewalks, making sure students proceeded without talking to us. However, one student did talk to us. He says he sees Brendan at lunch every day, and he doesn't seem like a troublemaker because he says he's respectful, always smiling, and is nice to his teachers. His uncle might have forced him because Brennan, I don't think he would do it by himself. And says most people in the school, just like him, are shocked after hearing today's news. Reporting live in Michicot, Chris Duffy, Action 2 News. And you still see that today in, in certain pockets. You still get that feedback on people who, who don't perhaps believe Brendan is innocent. They um, sort of counter it, dampen it down a little by saying exactly that. that we don't think he did it without um, somebody guiding him or... Right. Almost everybody admits, even those who are convinced of guilt or say they are, almost all of them were, will admit that there's some mitigation, if you will, in Brendan's case. But you are exactly right that there are many, many people and the percentage of them, I'm convinced, gets higher as you get closer to Manitowoc County, Wisconsin. There are many, many people who, in no small part through some counterfactual thinking, are utterly convinced, convinced beyond any doubt, that both Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey are guilty. And is that, is that small town bias, Dean? Is that, is that just tunnel vision? Because you have a, a plethora of information that's, that speaks to Brendan's innocence. You, you have the input of legal scholars, of false confession experts that have disproven and, and you know, reverse engineered this, these series of statements from Brendan. But yet you still have the idea that persists uh, at a grassroots level, at a local level, that perhaps he, he did do something, despite all of the evidence to the contrary, and you know the lack of evidence, the zero evidence that links Brendan to any type of crime. I don't know that it's so much tunnel vision. That kind of confirmation bias or you know other cognitive biases have nothing to do with where you live or, you know, or how populous the area is. But I do think it has, in this case, or in any case, much to do with being local, you know, being geographically close to the area of a crime, because whether you like it or not, you now, we all find ourselves in social feedback loops, if you will. Gossip gets passed around, treated as received wisdom or just common local understanding. And at least in and around Manitowoc County, with this family, this extended family associated with the salvage yard, there are no small number of people in that part of the state who probably would say exactly what Michael O'Kelly is quoted or heard saying in Making mm. a Murderer. And I don't remember the exact words. I'm going to paraphrase loosely, but he makes a comment on tape that, that is excerpted in one of the Making a Murderer episodes. 
to the effect that every branch of the Avery tree appears to be rotten and that the whole tree ought to be cut off at the trunk. You know, something, I'm, again, I'm paraphrasing, yeah. but something to that effect. Yeah. And I think O'Kelly unwittingly captured a, a broad stripe of local sentiment, unfortunately. That's in one of his emails to Kaczynski, and he reads it oh, at the post conviction. Okay, agreement. yeah, I in my mind, yeah. I'm seeing an image of him yes. speaking those words. But my my point is, I think that they're locally in and around northeastern Wisconsin. You'd find a large number of people who agree with that basic sentiment, even though they've never met any member of the Avery family. They've never been mm. to the Avery salvage yard, but yes. you know they're they're in the milieu in which this has just come to be a prevailing opinion. Now, add to that the supposition that many Americans, especially I think white Americans and you know middle class and up and higher Americans, you know the upper socioeconomic strata in this country. I think they tend, tend to make a supposition that the police are right. Mm -hmm. that, that if the police have made an accusation, it's well-founded and true. You know, in many, in many subcultures in America, you don't go to court starting with a presumption of innocence. You go to court starting with a real presumption of guilt, aside from what the legal rules are. Now, there are other subcultures and areas in America where there isn't this overweening faith that the police are reliable and that they, you know, that their accusations are fair and reliable. But in a place like Manitowoc County, you know, the, the police have the wind at their back um, with the public. Yeah. Now, if I could touch on Judge Willis's stipulation in June of 2007, as it relates to the pre-sentencing investigations report, Judge Willis clearly documents his issues with Brendan's statement. So for example, uh, the charges of first degree sexual assault and kidnapping, which were added to the information after the police interviewed uh, Brendan were dismissed by the state before trial. The account attributed to, to Mr. Dassey is based on only one of his interviews. He was interviewed by police on other occasions during which he gave somewhat different accounts of what happened. He also at some point recanted his statements admitting involvement in the crimes. Then he goes on to say the physical and forensic evidence introduced at Mr Avery's trial failed to provide corroborating support for a number of the allegations attributed to Mr Dassey. As one significant example, there was no physical or scientific evidence demonstrating that Teresa Hulbuck was ever present. An expert witness called on behalf of Mr. Dassey at his trial, Dr. Gordon and a Dr. White retained by counsel, both called into question much of the information provided by Brennan Dassey because of his intellectual limitations, his susceptibility to suggested answers and the nature of the techniques used. Now, for me, when I read that, it's like Judge Willis is making a clear case for the unreliability of Brendan's statements and the lack of corroborative evidence. And we have co-defendants tried for the same crime on two different sets of facts. So the state argues to the Avery jury that contrary to Brendan's March 1st story, Teresa Halbach was killed in the garage and that only one man was responsible for her death. And that man was Avery. Yet to Brendan's jury, the state argues that Teresa Halbach was stabbed and killed in Avery's bedroom, according to the March 1st statement, and that both Avery and Brendan were responsible for her death. Does that violate their due process? And why did the state choose not to introduce any of Brendan's statements at Avery's trial? Well, let's unpack all this. Yeah. First of all, you're right about Judge Willis's comments at Stephen Avery's sentencing. And without taking away anything from Judge Willis that he's due, I will say that most of the credit for that goes to the lengthy, careful, 
and detailed brief that Jerry Buting primarily wrote mm -hmm. in advance of Stephen Avery's sentencing, disassembling the state's narrative and the reliability of Brendan's final March 1 interview. But to go then to, to your questions, the state the state had to live, in a sense, with the confession it got from Brendan Dassey in Brendan Dassey's trial. It would have been awkward at best for a theory of prosecution to have proceeded along these lines. Well, he did it, but he lied about how he did it. He did it completely different than he admitted uh, his involvement being. It also would have been untenable in addition to being awkward because there really wasn't any physical evidence to support the alternate theory that the state relied on at Avery's trial of you know yeah. being killed in the garage. Um, so, so the state was stuck, uh, I think, as a strategic matter with having to sell Brennan's false confession as true or at least sufficiently true to remove reasonable doubt about his guilt. That statement, that March 1 statement by Brendan's could not be introduced by the state at Stevens' trial, absent Brendan testifying at Stevens' trial for a simple constitutional reason in the United States that also would apply in Australia and the other English speaking uh, legal systems. And that is this, that statement was made out of court. It was an accusation against Stephen made out of court and thus hearsay, you know, a statement offered for its truth, not made in court in front of this jury. And as a hearsay accusation of guilt, we're entitled to confront that, meaning we're entitled to cross-examine the person who made that statement in front of our jury. Brendan did not agree to testify at Stephen's trial and indeed had an absolute right not to testify at Stephen's trial because he still faced a trial of his own and therefore could not be compelled to incriminate himself or to take the witness stand at all. Uh, again, as a matter of both the United States Constitution and the Wisconsin Constitution, the state constitution's protections being parallel here in this respect and uncontroversial again in the law of English speaking countries. So without Brendan testifying at Stephen's trial, the state could not offer against Stephen his out of court statement that accused Stephen of murderous conduct. So the state then in Stephen's trial was freed <laughs> of the you know absurdity and disprovability of Brendan's confession or you know his induced statement was freed of that at Stephen's trial and could construct a theory of prosecution that it liked better strategically. Yeah. Now then the final question you really asked is, okay, is it due process? Is it consistent with due process for the prosecution to present theory A of a crime at a first trial and inconsistent theory B of the very same crime against a different defendant at a second trial. Mm -hmm. The US courts on the whole have been quite tolerant of that practice of inconsistent theories of prosecution. Prosecutors can in, in some courts run into troubles if their two different theories of prosecution are utterly irreconcilable. You know, the one being true means the other has to be false. But if 
if inconsistent theories of prosecution can be reconciled with the guilt of both defendants, generally in the United States, prosecutors can get away with that as a matter of how US courts tend to interpret the requirements of the applicable due process clause of the constitution. That's shameful. Let's, let's be clear about that. That's a shameful line of doctrine for appellate courts to have produced and to continue to support. Shameful in the sense that if a trial is at bottom a search for the truth, then inconsistent theories of prosecution can't be that because the truth doesn't change depending on who is in the defendant's chair. Inconsistent theories of prosecution are not a search for the truth, they're a search for conviction and indeed for two convictions. Yeah. Do you think with Brendan not having testified now, we know that he probably was incapable of testifying and I, and I think in his own trial, he, he wasn't capable of testifying. Do you think him not testifying was a disservice to both of their trials? Because if he had testified in Stephen's trial, then you had Dr. White uh, and, and Dr. Gordon who could have dismantled the confessions and the statements. Well, Brendan did testify in his own trial, as I recall. Yes, he did. And of course he did not testify in the preceding trial of his uncle. I don't know that I would call that a disservice. You're right that Brendan's March 1, 2006 adopted narrative, you know, most of the important details of that were suggested or supplied by the police. Yeah. With, you know, a guttural or monosyllabic assent or adoption or acknowledgement by Brendan. But however you want to describe that March 1, 2006 statement, yes, it would have been left in small pieces, certainly yeah. by the end of cross-examination and probably by the end of his direct examination by the prosecutor. And then even after cross-examination of Brendan was complete, you're right, you know, we could have called Dr. Larry White, we could have called other experts, you know, to testify to both the suggestiveness of the manipulative techniques used by the police against Brendan and by his suggestibility, by his naivete and capacity to be easily pushed around and, and swayed by uh, more capable, more conniving adults. Yeah. So, you know, it, it would have been a mess and it, it's hard to believe that the jury would have credited anything in the end that Brendan said, because, you know, once, once you take apart the confession, well, why then should we rely on any other version of events this same boy at that time might give? And he, you know, he, he was certainly at the time, at 16 or 17, palpably uh, unequipped to handle you know, a, a process like a trial with yeah. uh, educated and experienced adults all around him in an adversarial setting. So, you know, I, I, I don't know that that's a disservice. The state, in a sense, was lucky in Stephen Avery's trial that, that they couldn't and didn't call and Dassey, but it's just hard to imagine that have ending, having ended well for anybody who wanted to be the proponent of anything Brennan said to the police. Yeah, yeah. I was fortunate to interview Dr. White, who, you know, was obviously engaged to assess the interrogation techniques and the voluntariness and reliability of Brendan's statements. 
I would imagine that failing to call upon readily available and paid for expert testimony to help instruct a jury, that that was ineffective lawyering. Would that be right? And, and would it be a possible IAC claim as it relates not to conduct, but to strategy? By Brendan's defense team at, at his trial? Yeah, by not using Dr. White, by not using expert testimony. Uh, you know, I, the legal question embedded in your question is whether this was a strategic choice by defense mm -hmm. counsel, and if so, whether it was at least minimally reasonable and, and informed. I don't know. What I do know is that uh, Jerry Butin and I, after Stephen Avery's trial ended in his conviction, talked to each other and said, look, let's offer Dr. White's report to the DASI defense team. And indeed, let's just offer to pay you know, out of our pockets, we'll pay for Dr. Yeah. White's time so that he doesn't have to go uncompensated. And, you know, so that Dassey's defense team, which had to rely on court approval and public defender funding for any experts it wanted, you know, so that this good expert is available to the def Dassey defense team. Jerry and I agreed that was the right thing to do. And um, I think I'm the one who called the Dassey defense team, one or another of the lawyers, and extended that offer to them. You know, Dr. White's available. He's done his report. You can have it. And to the extent there's a cost that, you know, can't be covered on, on a court appointment, Jerry and I are happy to pay for, for Dr. Yeah. White's time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. I mean, you know, the, the the lawyer or lawyers, whomever I was speaking to, you know, of Brennan's two uh, lawyers at that point, and I don't remember which of them I spoke to or if they were both on the call, mm -hmm. you know, when I made this call. But what I do remember is I got a I got a polite response, you know, thank you, appreciate that, yeah. that kind of response. And then I know in the end they didn't call him, didn't call Dr. White. Yeah. Now, again, I don't know, was that a strategic decision? If it was, was it the sort of strategic decision that would defeat a claim of ineffective assistance of counsel? I just, I don't know. And I'm not a judge, uh, so it's above my pay grade, I guess, to decide <laughs> questions like that. Yeah. I mean, when I spoke with Dr. White, he said that he had agreed to testify um, and had spoken briefly with Fremgen, but after initial interactions, the communication just stopped. And he did say, and I quote, when I learned that a false confession expert had not testified at Brendan's trial, I felt sick and worried. I wish I had been more proactive about testifying at Brendan's trial. If I had known then that there was no evidence of any sort to link Brendan to the killing of Teresa Hulbuck, I would have pushed harder to testify at his trial. Unfortunately, I didn't learn the whole story until I watched Making a Murderer. What does that say about the system? I mean, hindsight doesn't save the life of a 16-year-old child. What failed Brendan there? Well, it wasn't Dr. Larry White. Uh, I mean, he, yeah. he's exactly right. He did agree to do this. When we talked to him, he said, sure, I'll do it, you know, and I, I don't even think he was trying to, you know, I don't think that was even contingent on Jerry and I agreeing to pay him. I think, you know, he was, oh, yes. you don't need to do that. Well, we want to, well, you know, we'll, you know, he, he's a good man. He, yeah. he, this wasn't about money for him. So he did, he had, I know he had, because we talked to him, mm -hmm. agreed to testify. I'm just hearing now for the first time that he actually did have a conversation with Mark Fremgen. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, and I, but I still don't know why he wasn't called. What I do know is that none of this is Larry White's fault. None of it. No, absolutely. Is Larry White's absolutely. fault. And, mm -hmm. you know, the state public defender did fund two lawyers in Brendan's case, which is very unusual. And I credit the state public defender for, you know, allowing a second lawyer 
mm. absolutely merited in a longer trial like this with the volume of you know, police reports and crime lab reports and information that had to be mastered. Absolutely not a case a lawyer should do alone. Mm. So it was good that the public defender's office agreed to appoint two lawyers, but that doesn't change the fact that the defense of anybody who's relying on a lawyer appointed rather than privately retained is hampered by insufficient funding of defense of the poor in this country. That is a systemic, pervasive flaw in our system of justice. We greatly you know, fund the prosecution and investigation side of a case, and by enormous disparity underfund the defense side of a case. And Brendan had to rely on our indigent defense system and thus did not have adequate funding uh, for that defense. Now that doesn't explain not calling Dr. White for the reasons I've just laid out. We, we took the money out of it uh, for the DASI defense team. Uh, there, and there may have been other strategic reasons in the end, they didn't call Dr. White, I don't know. But, you know. Yeah. I know Dr. White was quite concerned that when he had heard that a false confession expert hadn't testified. You know, for him to say that he felt sick and worried, I thought was quite strong. Well, this was a false confession case. That's right. It was a prosecution that rested on a palpably, demonstrably false confession. And yes. to my recollection, was then completed by one other bit of possible corroboration. The only evidence I recall there being against Brendan Dassey was a demonstrably false and manipulated, coerced, March 1, 2006 confession, and a couple of bleach stain spots on the blue jeans of a teenage boy. Yeah. That's what you had. And how innocuous is that, right? Bleach stains, they live on a salvage yard. He helps in a garage. Yeah, please. I mean, please. You know, <laughs> and, and if they, if, if these, if this 16 or 15 year old boy and his uncle suddenly became housekeepers of the year, you know, neat yes. freaks yes. and and bleached the garage of every trace of Teresa Halbach. If we are willing to fantasize to that level, then how is it that they missed the deer blood Yes. on the floor yes how is it that they yes. missed the bullet that the police claim they found in plain view sitting in the middle of the garage floor four months later you know it just it it beggars belief it, yeah absolutely you know so that's what the case was yeah you know on that evidence somebody was 15 or 16 when he was taken into custody is still sitting in prison now for about half of his life has passed in prison. He's, he's passed or soon, soon will pass, you know, within weeks will pass yes. 15 years in custody. And as matters stand today, won't be eligible even to be considered for release until this now 30 year old man is well into his 50s. Yeah, it's outrageous. I think when in terms of Fremgen and Edelstein's strategy, uh, I have read that Fremgen wanted to focus on portraying Brendan as, you know, an, an empathetic, sympathetic character and not get into a battle of, you know, expert witnesses, which blows my mind because, as you said, this was a false confession case. If you don't have a jury that you educate on false confessions and the science and the neuroscience and, and all of those various elements that, you know, support why people give false confessions and particularly with someone like Brendan who, 
you throw into the mix his impairments, his speech and language impairments, the fact that he doesn't comprehend sentences longer than five words. How was that child ever able to, he didn't stand a chance, he didn't stand a chance. And I think with Fremgen not taking Dr. White forward was a massive, massive error of judgment. And as I've said before, I'm, I'm not a legal person, but I don't think you need to be to sit back and say that, how do you mount a false confession defense without a false confession expert? I don't know. I don't know. And, uh, you know, and there's another piece to this, as you'll recall, after the jury heard that entire interview on March 1, 2006, all three plus hours of it, as I recall, the only part the jury didn't hear was the few minutes at the end after the two law enforcement officers left the room and allowed Brendan's mother finally to come in and comfort him for a few minutes. And recall Brendan buries his face in his hands and says, they got into my head. They got into my head. The jury didn't hear that, okay, no. in Brendan's no, trial. That's right. That, those yeah. few minutes, which yeah. tell us something enormously important about what has just happened in the interrogation and allow us to see it. Yeah. Brendan Dassey's jury never heard and saw that. That's exactly right. And Fremgen stipulated that the remaining, I think it's 40 minutes of that March 1st interrogation was not relevant, was not relevant to the jury. I think speaking to your piece for the progressive, you, you write of racial disparity and the structural failures in the system and that courts give structure and durability to systemic racism and antipathy toward the impoverished, that courts tolerate two subsystems. Those with money often can achieve relatively good outcomes, while the millions who are poor usually are consigned to overwork underfunded indigent defenders and often processed into bad outcomes. I know we touched on that before, but it has me thinking, you know, was Kaczynski conceding Brendan's Miranda arguments an anomaly? Was Fremgen stipulating that the remaining 40 minutes was not relevant, an aberration? And then we have Brendan's first lawyer, Ralph Skilgelski, waiving Brendan's right to a preliminary hearing where the prosecution would have needed to show enough evidence exists to even charge Brendan. So is that a systemic failing of an apathetic system of justice? You know, a system that just didn't care too much for a 16 year old indigent kid with special needs and a kid that was absolutely incapable of withstanding interrogation techniques like read, incapable of understanding sentences longer than five words, as I said. And most importantly, incapable of invoking his constitutional right to silence, obviously not understanding Miranda and that the, the whole idea of the different and semantic variations of Miranda that he was read, I don't know how anyone would have quite understood that. Is that the level of defense you can expect if you're indigent? In a word, yes. And if I may elaborate, I could, I could construct at least hypothetical strategic explanations for every one of those decisions you described the lawyers making. I could do that. Mm -hmm. Waiving the so-called Miranda hearing, waiving the preliminary hearing, which is done frequently in Wisconsin. It shouldn't be, but it is done frequently. Maybe I could even maybe I could even stretch to assign as strategic the stipulation about the la all of the last 40 minutes of Brendan's interview, maybe. That's a tough call. I mean, I, that, 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 that's a, you know, I, have a, I, have, I personally have a hard time coming up with a straight face strategic reason to omit at least those last few minutes and Brendan's yeah. behavior and statement to his mother. But, even if you come up with some hypothesized strategic choice to explain all of those, aren't you exactly right that fundamentally what you're seeing here is apathetic lawyering, 
apathetic judging and cynical policing and prosecuting. By cynical, I mean nearly devoid of real empathy, devoid of real commitment to a presumption of innocence or even to a, a possibility of innocence, devoid of any real sense of the humanity of this damaged 16 year old kid. So instead of empathy from the police, for example, you get phony manipulative statements about, oh, I'm a police officer, but right now I, you know, I'm really a dad. I might, you know, I have a child about your age too, you know, and I'm not just a police officer here. I'm, I'm a father as well. You get, you get these self-serving cynical uh, and brutally manipulative statements that make a mockery of human empathy and make a mockery of human dignity or commitment to getting at the truth, if we can, and serving everybody and recognizing the humanity of everybody involved in this whole sordid play. So yeah, apathetic's a fair word for that. And the, the reality is, look, there are 20 million, 20 million criminal cases filed in American courtrooms every year. If you take out the 12 million of those that are minor traffic offenses, you have something like 8 million other misdemeanor and felony cases prosecuted in the United States every year. And all of this becomes really in many places, most places, something of an assembly line, a system of linked institutions that processes people down the line from the police at the front end to the prosecutors, to the trial courts, the public defenders, the crime labs, you know, from there to the Department of Corrections and the appellate courts simultaneously, and ultimately more than 90, 95% of the time to approval of the conviction by appellate courts, and then service of a sentence in custody of the Department of Corrections, or for more minor crimes under the surveillance and supervision of the Department of Corrections. And it, it, it's simply a system composed of these interconnected institutions that to my mind is deeply inhuman or inhumane at least, I guess inhumane is the better word. It's certainly composed of human beings at every step and at every level of the various institutions. The system is designed and operated by human beings but it turns out to be a very, very inhumane and dehumanizing system. Yes. That, as I say, we use millions of times a year or produces millions of widgets popping out at the end of that yeah. process uh, every year. One of the things that stayed with me with the understanding Rogers versus Richmond rightly was I thought it was tragically interesting that Butler, Bourne, and Dolsky and Johnson's justice system experience, dating back as far as nine, 1928, I think, was not too... Early 1800s in <laughs> some of the cases I, I looked at. Well, they were not too dissimilar to that of Brendan's, and I'm sure thousands and millions of others, in that there's no physical evidence. Yep. Um, what you say here, I think, is, is really relevant to, to Brennan's case as well, that the lack of evidence is not just surprising, but inexplicable. And, you know, while there's advancements in neuroscience, the notion of someone falsely confessing is still too counterintuitive for many, including the courts. How, how does that change? I had the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I... Uh... I could do an enormous amount of good.
as long as I could, you know, convey the answer and be convincing in conveying it to people. I don't know how we change it. Uh, courts lag behind science all the time. And the values of the humane arts are, are not um, widely prized um, in court systems. And that's true, not just in the United States. It's certainly true here, but it's it's not limited to the United States. You know, we part, I think, of the ways in which we accept as a society punishment meted out in our names is by dehumanizing the object of the punishment. You know, he becomes the defendant rather than having a name, or he gets a, yes. you know, he gets a prisoner ID number rather than a name. Yeah. And indeed, it's not the defendant or the accused alone who's dehumanized. We pretty quickly start speaking of the victim, sometimes remembering to use his or her name, often not. The witness. Yes. They don't have names. They they fill roles. You know, I I think in my first book, in the in the introduction or the preface to my first book, I I made a point of saying, look, you know, the the parties, the victim, the defendant, the witnesses, uh, the people who are called as witnesses or whose lives are most affected by a criminal trial are not the players. They're not the players in, in the drama. The, the players are the lawyers, the police officers, the judges, the clerks, and the person accused and the person who's a victim and the citizen witness, they're all the ball. <laughs> they're the ball. Mm -hmm that allow the, you know, the professional participants, the voluntary participants in this criminal enforcement system to play the game or to carry out the process. Uh, the others are, are the ball. And so it, it, it is a dehumanizing system and may, that may be essential uh, in a sense to allow us to accept the punishments we mete out. And, Australia, among developed countries, is relatively punitive, okay? I mean, you have a fairly punitive, by comparison to other developed democracies, you have a fairly punitive sort of record of corrections and criminal process, but you're nowhere near as punitive as the United States. Your average yeah. sentence length is, I don't know, maybe 60% of our average sentence length. Your per capita rate of incarceration is much lower than ours. We are, by both of those measures, almost the most punitive nation on the face of the earth. And I think part of what sustains that is the dehumanization that goes on in the process of criminal enforcement. Yeah, I, know, I think with ourselves, you know, it wouldn't be out of the ordinary to see somebody convicted of a homicide with a life sentence of 20 years, for example. But do you think that the system is in the process of correcting itself to ensure that other Brendans don't suffer the same type of fate? I think there's been some very modest and halting or uncertain progress in how juveniles are treated when they find themselves in police custody. Not in every state, not every juvenile. In fact, many of the protections are uh, gauged to kids younger than Brendan was at the time, but, you know, one fairly wide or broad area of advancement in the United States, finally, in the last couple of decades, has been the video recording of custodial statements. That is a bit of progress, and that has been broad in the United States. 
not necessarily universal yet, but broad. So it's, it's not that there's been no progress and it's not that progress is impossible. It is though true that progress always comes in the teeth of opposition from the police, opposition from prosecutors, opposition from courts, opposition from corrections departments. These are never, these are never allies in yeah. progress as a practical matter. They're opponents of it or grudging acceptance is the best we normally get when there is any progress at all. Yeah, I thought it was interesting recently in Maryland where advocates testified for the legislator in support of House Bill 315, which is a bill to ensure kids have the opportunity to consult with lawyers before a custodial interrogation. I think it'll be interesting to see how that one plays out. It will, you know, and, and we are seeing efforts like this popping up in some, but nowhere near all states. You, yeah. you have to bear in mind, though, as, as you lift your sight a bit, that this particular country still hasn't even overcome the death penalty. You know, yeah. Virginia is about to abolish the death penalty. That's really encouraging because Virginia had been and has been, even in recent years, a pretty aggressive user of the death penalty. And it's about to abolish it. That's great. Yeah. That's a big step. That's a big step. But mm. the federal statutes still allow the death penalty and close to half the states still mm. have capital punishment as an available sentence uh, in this country. So, mm. you know, we're, <laughs> are we making some progress? Yes. But we have an awful long way to go before, to my mind, any of us with any sense of humility could claim that we're operating a justice system. Yeah, yeah. The, the whole idea of the death penalty is such an affront to humanity. It really is. It's. Um, I think the United States, there's only a couple of other countries and they may be developing countries or perhaps Singapore, but there's only a handful of, of countries that still practice the, uh, the yeah, We're not in good company on the whole. Okay. On the whole, we are no. not in good company. Iran, the People's Republic of China, a number of rogue regime regimes still have the death penalty. I think Japan may still in theory have the death penalty. You say Singapore, you, you can point to, you know, a few developed countries that still have it, yeah. but among the Western, you know, countries that um, declare themselves democracies, exactly. the United States far and away is the most aggressive user of the death penalty. It's so at odds with the idea of being like a bastion of democracy to the run up to the end of the Trump presidency, you know, that there was quite a, a death penalty spree. It's just horrendous. There, there was, but you're looking not at democracy broadly here, you're looking at criminal enforcement systems. Mm -hmm. And those criminal enforcement systems way back and deep are rooted in other institutions like slavery that we had in this yes, country for yes. 350 years or so. And the ongoing repression of people of African descent and efforts to control that population, to control their bodies, mm. well after slavery ended as a legal matter. And, you know, today we are a very, we remain a very heterogeneous society with institutions that grew up around the inequalities that not only existed, but were overtly intended. 
about it. So if we could just update people a little bit. Uh, we know uh, in terms of Brendan Dassey, his appeals have been exhausted in the Supreme Court. So let's talk about Stephen Avery for a minute. Although These, we, you should note that Brendan still has options. What are those options? He, he's never filed a what's called a 97406, what a, a post-conviction motion. So after your direct appeal is done, you can still come back on a what's called a collateral. It's, it used to be state habeas corpus. So it's similar to the federal process, but it's in the state With what courts. kinds of arguments? Newly discovered evidence. Um, and possibly ineffective assistance of counsel when you have that. It, but you can go back to the state trial court, is, is Jerry's point, and uh, that, that remains open to Brendan. So where to now legally for Brendan, Dean? What, what pathways to relief via the courts would be viable. We know Brendan has never filed a post-conviction motion. I think it's a 97406, correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. And I watched an interview recently where you suggest that possibly ineffective assistance of counsel may remain an option. Can you explain to us what the process is for filing a post-conviction motion such as that and on what potential grounds Brendan could do so, in your opinion? Because his conviction has been affirmed on direct appeal, and then he's already been through post-conviction process that you rightly describe as beginning in state court, in fact, back in the trial court with a motion under section 974.06 of the Wisconsin statutes, Brendan's already been through all that. So he, he is facing straight into the nearly impenetrable wall of finality doctrine. Mm -hmm. You know, he's essentially, as the courts would say, exhausted his remedies at this point. And American courts are fond, overweeningly fond, uh, finality as a value rather than mm. maybe accuracy. For example, uh, in judicial determinations. So for Brendan now in court, I think it would take significant newly discovered evidence, evidence that couldn't have been discovered and wasn't discovered earlier to get him back into court. Might that concern ineffective assistance of counsel? Yes, potentially. Might such newly discovered evidence go more directly? to exculpation or to you know, raising new questions about innocence, yes, potentially. But absent that, he's, he's gonna have very little chance of getting a judicial remedy. Mm. He instead, in theory, could have an executive branch remedy, namely clemency, but that too, is is desperately rare, not just in Wisconsin, but in most states. And in spite of, or notwithstanding all the attention that some of President Trump's pardons got, clemency is still quite rare in the federal system as well. Yeah. If you think about the overall number of people serving sentences or facing trial and conviction. So in Wisconsin, the state constitution gives the governor and only the governor uh, the power of clemency, either amnesty outright or commutation of a sentence, meaning you know truncating it or shortening it, or a pardon um, in the end, you know, uh, forgiving a conviction and sentence that have already been served. The governor has that, and it's a discretionary call. Um, the current governor is uh, granting some limited clemency, but no commutations. And he's imposed limits on himself, on yes. the pardons he's even willing to consider. Our previous yeah. governor uh, ruled out even considering the use of executive clemency. He was the only officer who could under our state constitution, and he renounced, set aside that power, because I suspect he didn't view it as furthering his own future political ambitions.
That's the past governor. Yeah. We have a governor yeah, now, again, Walker. who's yeah. using executive clemency in modest ways. And we'll, we'll see whether some of the injustice of Brendan's conviction ever is righted. Um, through executive yeah. clemency, or possibly, again, if there's newly discovered evidence, through a judicial process. With newly discovered evidence, could the newly discovered evidence that Kathleen Zellner has put forward in Stephen Avery's appeal potentially influence further claims for Brendan? Yes, potentially it could. You know, it just would depend on what the courts wind up accepting and then where Stephen Avery's case goes. But it is entirely conceivable that doubts raised about Stephen's guilt then also would raise doubts about Brendan's guilt. Yeah, yeah. Be interested to see what happens, the ruling that's due on Kathleen Zellner's latest filing. Right. When we talk about Evers, he strikes me as somebody who is progressive to a certain extent. And there is much talk, and there has been much talk since he ran for, for governor about a commitment to reform, but it's yet to materialize. We know that he set up the Wisconsin Pardon Advisory Board, and I think to date there's been about 107 pardons. Yes, I do keep track. The American Civil Liberties Union of Wisconsin and other groups and advocates have called on Evers to change his policy of only considering clemency for prisoners who've completed their sentences. It's really an arbitrary take on clemency. The criteria are arbitrary. Why do you think there is such a reluctance? Obviously, he has competing priorities with a GOP and obviously, you know, the extent of COVID within the state. But this isn't something that he needs to cross the aisle to even do. No, no. And it, it, it strikes me that perhaps Walker placed his faith in the judicial branch. And we know and research shows us and tells us, and I'm sure someone like Governor Evers, who's an educated man, comes from that type of background, would be aware of the fact that the system doesn't always get it right. So how can you defer to the judicial branch as a fail safe? So for me with Wisconsin, there's zero pathway for relief for people who are wrongfully convicted outside of the innocence project. And that's dependent on DNA. And we know 500 items were tested and not one of them was positive for Brendan's DNA. Why do you think think he is so reluctant to embrace commutation? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know Governor Evers personally. My sense of him is that he is a gentle, well-meaning mm. man. Yeah. But it will take more than that. It will take putting a priority on and feeling the urgency of power committed to one office and therefore to one human being to rectify mistakes that the courts haven't fixed, have created, but haven't corrected. Mm -hmm. Now, in a perfect world, courts would clean up their own messes, mm -hmm. but they don't always do that. In fact, they frequently do not do that. And, yeah. you know, in, in the system implemented by the state constitutions in the United States as to the states and the U.S. Constitution as to the federal government, the executive and the executive alone has the power to grant mercy or to cut through procedural banality, to cut through finality, to cut through excuses and hand-wringing over convictions that shouldn't have happened but haven't been set aside through judicial process. The executive alone has that power. Unless and until an executive puts some emphasis on the power that the executive has and therefore the responsibility to look beyond one's own political ambitions, to look beyond one's own caution or fear 
and to use that power because no one else can. You know, until one accepts the responsibility that is proportionate to the power, you don't see much in the way of clemency. It's a shame. It is a shame because there, there truly is no institutional constraint here. Yeah. The person with the power to grant clemency has the power to do the right thing, to do what is morally correct. And to my mind, when you have power, you have responsibility in the same measure. Because there's no one to whom you can defer. If you could leave listeners with one thing as it relates to Brendan and his continued fight for justice, what would it be? Don't give up. Don't give up. This young man is probably innocent. And he certainly, he certainly shouldn't be in prison today, to my view. Um, and I think millions around the world share that view. His uncle probably is innocent. This is a kid, though, for whom the process failed in particularly spectacular fashion. Everywhere you look, yeah. the process failed him in spectacular fashion. He's also somebody who should have, with any luck with his health, decades ahead of him to try to make something of his life with freedom. Don't give up. Don't give up on Stephen, Avery, and for all the reasons I just said, including the longer horizon in front of him, please don't give up on Brendan Dassey. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dean. I, I appreciate your time and your patience. It's been a couple of hours, so thank you very, very much. I'm, I'm sure listeners will get a great deal from, from what you've shared. I was honored to be here. Thank you. evidence that you've tested all of it did you ever find any dna of a gentleman named brendan dassey anywhere in no. all of your tests no i did not not one shred right no i did not find his dna and you had his profile yes I 